Hello and welcome everybody. Today we're here to ask one simple question. Will the new Fnatic lineup be any good? Now, we all know what has happened with this Fnatic lineup. Obviously, they have massively revamped it in recent memory. Nick Dawson Roy obviously joined a couple of months ago before the player break. And since then, they have added Fasher. He has been the latest addition to the lineup. And I'll be honest, I'm pretty excited with this Fnatic lineup for a couple of reasons. Now, the first major reason is firepower. Now, when we're looking at the firepower for this new Fnatic lineup, the first two players that we're going to look at are Roy and Nikados. And this is Copenhagen Flame stats I've taken from 2021, just for argument's sake for the start. And as you can see, Nikodos and Roy um, were comfortably the best players for this Copenhagen Flames lineup. Roy, in particular, was absolutely smurfing it in 2021. And if we switch it up and look at the 2022 statistics, it's pretty much the same. If anything, Nikodos was actually playing a little bit better overall. Um, and what we can basically see here is that Fnatic went and picked the two biggest pieces of firepower out of that Copenhagen Flames roster and have just slotted it into their own. In terms of fragging ability, this Fnatic roster is definitely going to bang, as we can see, the two best players from Copenhagen Flames. But even when we start to look at some of the other members on the roster, so I've just picked up Mezzi here. As you can see, Mezzi has also been a pretty solid force for Fnatic during the time he has been with the roster. All of these ratings are pretty decent, pretty good. We're obviously looking at 2021 here, but this is what we're seeing when he first joins the roster. Obviously, if we look back his time on Endpoint, he was turbo smurfing down in tier two on Endpoint. And then there's obviously not much to go off of really in 2022. Um, around this time is when Fnatic are having some problems, so we don't read into those too much. But as you can see, just in general, Mezzi is a pretty high output player for Fnatic. He is putting in pretty good ratings here. We look at um, ESL Pro League Season 15, which is probably, you know, if we're looking through this, the most stacked event that they've played. It's pretty good stuff. From Fnatic and this is their in-game leader so this is the guy we're not expecting to frag obviously here this is when he took up the in-game leadership reigns and I will touch on Mezzi as an in-game leader a little bit later in the video but just in terms of pure potential on fragging output Mezzi ticks the box for sure now we should all know by now what Crims can offer so I'm not going to touch too much on the veteran Swede this guy Fasher is the last guy we're going to look at and to be honest, he has been smurfing in tier two for ecstatic for a very long time. These ratings, uh, you know, apart from obviously the odd exception, this is a one mapper. We, we don't take that too seriously. He is absolutely blasting booties down in tier two. Fasha has been an absolute force um, for a long time for this ecstatic. What was Lingby Vikings? If we just go back and look at 2021. Again, a few outlier events, but in general, it's all pretty good. It's all pretty outstanding stuff. Ever since he joined this Lingby Vikings roster, they became a bit of a force in tier two. And as you can see, um, towards the back end of 2021, they were they were placing very, very well in like a lot of tier two events. We got first, second, you know, all of these types of placings. And I am pretty excited to see what Fasha can do at tier one. That is a little caveat I will put is we haven't seen too much of Fasha against the best of the best, the absolute top teams that CSGO has to offer. So there definitely has to be some semblance of caution, I would say, when you're thinking about Fasha um, stepping up into tier one. Yeah, I think the potential is there for sure. And I'm excited to see how that firepower translates if he can keep doing it at this higher level. But it's definitely not a surefire thing. It's no guarantee. And that is one of the question marks that I will mention later on in the video surrounding this new Fnatic roster. The other thing I really like about um, this Fnatic lineup is that the balance of roles seems to make sense. Now, what I mean by that is um, when you put together a CSGO team, you need to flesh out a number of roles. And it's just kind of based around how the game is fundamentally played. On T side, you generally need one like hardcore lurker. You're going to need like a couple more aggressive players. And I think Fnatic actually really have this down to a T. So we'll look at Fasha first. And as we can see, we're looking at um, his time on Ecstatic. He was the best player on Ecstatic by far. But what I wanted to look at was his opening kills. Um, let's just uh, bring the sample size down a little bit here. So we get some of the other players that played for very ecstatic. Obviously, they swapped their AWPA, um, 
relatively recently. But but the most important thing we want to see here is that the amount of attempts that Fascia is taking is pretty high. He was an aggressive force on this ecstatic lineup. He is an aggressive rifler. And I think that is pretty much excellent for what Fnatic needed. Now, obviously, Crims is probably going to be that lurker on T side and he's probably going to be that hardcore anchor on CT side. And so getting somebody who, in my opinion, is probably going to play that aggressive lurk role, that Roma type of role. Fascia is some guy who fits the bill. And I think in terms of personnel, this was one of the best signings that they could have made. Now, we'll just take a brief moment to touch on on what I think this roster is going to look like in terms of roles. Obviously, we've got Nikodos on the AWP. We've got Roy to be part of an entry pack. He's going to be that aggressive entry fragging rifler. And I assume either Mezzi or Fascia is going to take up the rare other spot on that kind of map control entry trio. Normally, you kind of have like a three-man pack that will be your kind of map control trio and i think either fascia or mezzi will slot into that role and then the other one will take on the aggressive lurk role i'd like to see mezzi go into the pack with roy and nikodos and then fascia be given the freedom to do that aggressive lurking i see the logic in some senses about having your in-game leader do that aggressive lurk role because there is um, a lot of information he can gather from that position and use it to call but i just think fascia just in terms of of firepower and in terms of output because he doesn't have the in-game leadership mantle, which Mezzi is going to have on his shoulders, I think it would be better for Fascia to be that Roma-type player who's going to go get aggressive map control on his own. He's going to look for, for picks and look for fights and look for information. I think Fascia is the guy who they should probably be having do that. However, I could see either one of them filling that role. On CT side, it's going to be a bit more fluid. I'm sure Crims is going to be uh, an anchor player. I'll be interested to see who's going to perform the other anchor role. I might be Mezzi, could be Fascia, could be Roy. I think any of them can do a job as an anchor player. But definitely on T side, you can see the roadmap kind of laid out already in front of you. I think it makes a lot of sense. And so I am looking forward to seeing this team play because I think the roles are going to make sense. I think there's going to be hopefully some chemistry there. I, you know, I can't talk for what it's like behind the scenes, but in terms of who these people are as players and how they fit in the game, I think it's going to fit together really, really well. Now, there are a couple of things I want to talk about as potential problems with this new Fnatic roster. This isn't me saying um, I think these are particularly concerning problems necessarily, but it's more... When I look at a roster, I obviously look at all the good things, and that's what I've talked about. I've talked about all the positive things that you can see happening with this Fnatic team. But on the flip side, you have to use your brain and your analysis to foresee where the potential roadblocks might lie in this Fnatic team becoming, let's say, top 10 team in the world. And that is the potential that I do think this roster has. One of the question marks I have is around Nikodos and his consistency as an AWPA. If we look here, we do actually see in generally he has been putting up pretty good numbers so far for Fnatic uh, and back on Copenhagen Flames. Similar sort of thing. We're going match by match here and obviously we're taking a pretty small sample size. But, you know, we look through and we see generally pretty decent ratings with the odd stinker. I think the thing with Nikodos is, is that you do get these stinker of games, you know, obviously a... Uh, uh, Glaring example is this one here against Skade, um, this one here against Dignitas. You know, you've got a couple not quite so bad against Blue Jays. Pretty reasonable score lines, I'd say, in losses. But I do think, as you can see here with Ents, you see games where Nikodos does kind of fall off a cliff. We've got another one here against Miles. That is a real, real shocker. Now, you could say it is potentially based around the way Nikodos plays. I think he is pretty aggressive. All things considered, he's not afraid to re-peak. He's not afraid to take jewels that maybe seem more even than you might like to take as an AWPA. I just wonder if this play style is ever going to come back to bite Fnatic in the butt when he is playing against elite AWPAs and he's going to be playing against elite AWPAs probably on a more regular basis playing Fnatic than he was playing for Copenhagen Flames. I just wonder if this style that he plays is going to see him get shut out of games a little bit more often. And Fnatic are going to struggle if he does get shut out of games. It's just the way that the tier one scene works and how the game works at a tier one level. If you have an AWPA 
who's a dedicated upper. He's going to get the gun more often than not. You're going to invest in him by buying him that gun a lot and playing around it. You need to make sure that that guy is consistent and that guy is going to get the output that he needs more often than he is not. And that's just a question for me around Nikodos. Can he do that? I think he has the ability and the potential to do so. I think he probably needs to just adjust a little bit the way he's playing. You don't want to take away that aggressive nature. You don't want to take away that potential explosiveness that Nikodos definitely has. At the same time, you would like to see, or I would like to see, his decision-making improve just a little bit so that he is not so easy to shut down and he is not as likely to have these games where he disappears, you know, like this game versus ends, for example. Another question I have, and I will use this tournament as an example, is what are we going to get out of Mezzi as an in-game leader? Now, first and foremost, if we go to the stats section of this tournament uh, and we go down to the leaderboards and we take a look at rating 2.0, obviously this is a pretty straightforward way to look at things, but we scroll, we scroll, we scroll. We have to go down here to see Mezzi. Mezzi had a pretty taut, poor tournament at Pinnacle by his standards. This was his first tournament in charge of the in-game leadership role. And it wasn't the greatest from Mezzi from a personal standpoint. Now, obviously, as the in-game leader, he doesn't necessarily need to mad frag. And I think outside of Mezzi... They have four players who can frag. You've got Crims, who, you know, one of the most long-standing, consistent players in this game. You've got Roy and Nikodos, who I've shown you. They've shown that they can do it at the top level. And you've got Fasher, who let's see if he makes the step up. But Mezzi definitely looked like he was suffering from having that leadership role placed upon him. So that is a question I have to ask is, A, can he keep his personal numbers at a decent level? I think that would help Fnatic a lot if he could. And the other question I have is, is he going to be a good enough leader just as a caller? Because if his stats are going to fall off, then he needs to be doing something as a leader. Now, we can have a little look at the FTU. So this is obviously a little grid that helps us just determine roughly how well a team has done. You can look at stuff like round win percentages, opening kill percentages, blah, blah, blah. And they can tell you a little bit about how a team are doing. So if we look at Fnatic CT side, their round win percentage was pretty decent. It was up here with the decent teams at the tournament. Obviously, Big got through to the playoffs. Uh, obviously, Heroic went on and went the, won the whole thing. But as you can see, this CT side FTU is looking pretty decent. Decent number of multi kills. Probably want that to go up a little bit, but you know they're five and four, four five percentages, all pretty decent. Damage traded is a little bit low, and I would suggest this is probably they were a new team. They were playing with a stand in. This is like it says here. It's a teamwork related thing. I think with more synergy and with more time to work on the playbook and your setups and stuff, this probably improves naturally. Um, and we look at the T side as well. This is where it's a little bit less positive, the signs. I think these numbers are not fantastic. Looking at the rest of the, the field, the teams that were doing well in this event, so we look at Astralis and Heroic, had a pretty significant round win percentage above. And I would say when you're looking at the T side, that is when the in-game leader is going to be earning his salt. And this was the side that Fnatic were a little bit worse on. Their multi-kills were not very great, so that suggests the individuals were not stepping up. And so that is maybe outside of Mezzi's control, but on the flip side, you can ask, is Mezzi putting his players in the positions and in the situations where they can succeed? Maybe not. And this opening kill percentage was really, really low. And again, I think a lot of that, yeah, you can uh, put that down to the individuals and say, well, the individuals need to step up and get a headshot. Equally, I think you need to ask the question again, is the in-game leader creating scenarios where you can get that opening kill? Because if you're taking 10 opening jewels and you're unfavored in seven or eight of them because of the way your calling is happening and the way the rounds are being played out, this number isn't going to improve. So again, chicken and egg scenario, you can argue, is it the individuals or is it the calling? But I think that needs to improve. And again, the traded, I would say that will probably improve with time. Now, the thing... I'd like to look at as a positive for Mezzi is I think these 4v5 percentages again are really where an in-game leader can earn 
their keep and this being decent and actually if we look at it it was the third best for the tournament actually better than Astralis is that does give me some sense of hope that when you're getting in the man disadvantage situations and you need to be creative and the team needs to come together to make plans and make a play and upset the odds this being decent does give you some hope moving forward now a lot of this is speculation guys i fully understand and aware of that I think it is speculation based on a pretty decent amount of information, decent amount of extrapolation. And I have, I would say, been fair here in kind of prefacing it and saying there are potential arguments for and against whether this is the in-game leader's fault or not. Obviously, almost never entirely the in-game leader's fault, but they should at least be getting you to ask the questions. So I'm asking, is Mezzi going to cut it as a caller? Is he going to be able to keep his numbers up? remains to be seen as of yet now the final question i have around this fanatic roster is fascia and is he gonna step up now if we scroll through his events this is from 2022 with ecstatic as you can see we're not really all too often playing against the best teams generally playing in tier two however there are some examples and if we go to this fun spark ulti event fascia second best rated player at the event only behind shiro and as you can see from the team list actually it was a pretty good set of teams if we go to the overview and we'll show you who ecstatic were playing in this event opened up with a game against entropic didn't go very well for the side at all got to owed whatever we move on but as you can see in this lower bracket run fascia's turbo smurfing against complexity obviously this complexity team were pretty doo-doo in the first half of 2022 but you know, you beat what's put in front of you. And then here again, he's turbo smurfing against K23, a good tier two team. Obviously, Norbert and Fame are now on VP. And even in this rematch against Entropic, he is playing pretty damn well. Now, problem is, didn't play against Gambit, didn't play like against Big or Astralis. So we didn't really get to see him play against the best of the best. And I think that is a general problem with Basha and him coming into Fnatic is you've got to ask yourself the question how often has he actually played against the best tier one opposition not very often at all that has to be a question mark around whether Fasha can step up and produce these types of numbers you know this 1.36 1.2 you know over lots of maps so what we're seeing here not so much here but you understand what I mean. We're seeing a lot of consistency and good overall numbers um, from lots of maps, which shows a consistent output from Fasha, which is what makes him so appealing as a player and as a potential pickup. That consistency is pretty incredible. Map to map to map, tournament to tournament to tournament. Will that consistency and that output remain when he is playing against tier one teams, the best of the best, you know, your gambits, obviously Cloud9 now, your teams like Na'Vi and FaZe, and even outside of those very best like Ents and G2, is that level of performance going to stay? Has to be a question, has to be asked. I suspect Fasha will do fine, but it's got to be a question you ask. I hope you guys enjoyed that video and found it informative. Let me know what you thought down in the comments. Let me know what you want to see in future. Demo reviews, specific players. I don't care. I will do it. Ask and ye shall receive. Until then, remember to subscribe. If you don't subscribe, you're a little bastard. I right? Yeah, I said it. Tough love is needed sometimes. And if you didn't like it, I, I don't know why. I, you know, who who are you to not like this video? You know, if you're a Fnatic fan, I, I was pretty positive. If you're not a Fnatic fan, maybe you're not a Fnatic fan. Maybe you hate Fnatic. In which case, I don't know, do you not like Orange? <laughs>